The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Grateful to have you here uh, to worship with us. Uh, we finished up the newcomers class this morning and they're going to have a fellowship following the service. But just what a special group of uh, newcomers and just been encouraged sharing your testimonies and just had a wonderful time in that class. So thank the Lord for continuing to just add uh, beautiful lovers of Christ to our numbers. I liked, uh, heard a good report on the ladies' retreat, and so a special thank you to all the ladies who worked so hard uh, to bring that retreat together, and I'm just hearing great reports, so thank you so much for your work there. I want to remind you, in case you didn't know it, next week is Resurrection Sunday. It is Easter. Yeah, that's right, Timmy. And I just want to encourage you, we're going to pull out of Peter, and we're just going to stare at the reality and the beauties of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to go get friends, family, neighbors, anyone that you can find, compel them to come in to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So do the work of an evangelist, get out there. Uh, people need to know of a resurrection that's coming. Well, this morning, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to finish up this chapter, Lord willing, this morning. And so I told you we're going to kind of move quickly through this letter, and I just had every tension of doing so until we hit gold. We hit gold and we came across some diamonds, and you have to dig for diamonds. I've told you before, I don't want to just rake up a bunch of leaves, but we, we need, when we hit these things, we need to understand them and meditate on them and grow deeply in them. And so this has been a rich, rich chapter. And what we're going to look at this morning is just such a powerful close to a good season in the Word of God. My heart is just full this morning as we open this up in worship. So before we start, I just want to give you some announcements uh, regarding this beautiful week now that we will remember what Peter has been teaching us here in this epistle. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the triumphal entry when Jesus entered in now and, and he's going to make them crown me or kill me. And it's the climax of this uh, Passion Week that we will begin looking at this week. Friday night, Good Friday, Ray will be preaching on the cross of Jesus Christ and we will have communion together. And then on Sunday, we'll gather corporately to celebrate the empty tomb that has given us full hearts and eternal life. So may God pour out his abundant blessings on us this week as we remember the passion of our Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this high holy week. We thank you that every week our hearts are filled with these realities. But it's a special time of remembrance. And I pray that you will meet us in a beautiful way. I pray on that Good Friday service, Lord, that we will open up the Word of God and we will look at the cross. I pray that our hearts would be full, that one would go to a tree, the Son of God, in our place. I pray, Lord, that you will minister deeply to all of us as we gaze at this beautiful cross. And I pray for Resurrection Sunday, Lord, that we will see the fullness and the beauty that He has risen. And I pray that every heart would be changed and different and transformed because of the resurrection and the power that is ours now in Jesus Christ. God, I pray now, as we finish up this chapter, that you would meet us. I pray that every heart would be overwhelmed with what we hold in our hands here this morning called the Word of God. I pray that you will show us how it all ties together and that you will meet us and that at the end of the service, worship would flow from every heart. Any unbelieving heart that may have walked in here this morning, I pray, God, let this be the day of their visitation. Let them see the glory of Christ and believe and repent and love that Christ with all of their being. God, we pray, meet us here now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we approach your throne. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1, if you'll look with me in verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This word above all earthly powers. It's God's Word and it's His revelation to us. 
And it's been saving and changing and making people new, people of God for thousands and thousands of years. It testifies to itself that it's the truth. It's perfect. It's pure. It endures forever. It's righteous. It's holy, just, and good. It's without error. It will all be fulfilled. The Word of God is indeed truth. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training us in righteousness. And so what we hold in our hands then this morning is the sure Word of God. And it's been transforming lives throughout history. I'm going to share a few with you. On June 27, 1819, Adoniram Judson baptized his first convert in Burma. His wife, Anne Hasseltine, described how Mwang now had responded to the Scripture. and said, a few days ago, the man said, I was reading with him Christ's Sermon on the Mount, and he was deeply impressed and unusually solemn. These words, said he, take hold of my liver, and they make me tremble. God spoke through Isaiah the prophet 2,700 years before that, and he said, this is the man to whom I will look, God that he is humble and contrite in spirit, and he trembles at my word. Thousands of years, the Bible's been taking hold of people's lives and making them tremble because they reveal who God is. They reveal who we are in our sin, and they reveal God's righteous response to sin and God's grace now toward us and his son, how he could bring us back into relationship. And the word of God has been doing this for millennia. Augustine, 4th century, reads Romans 13, 13, calls him out of his sin of immorality. He's convicted and he's converted on the spot and becomes one of the great leaders in the church in our history. Martin Luther was a downtrodden monk. And he said, night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement in Romans 1, the just shall live by faith. And then I grasped But the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. And thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. Jonathan Edwards was reading 1 Timothy 1.17. He said, the first instance that I remember or that sort of inward sweet delight in God and divine things that I have lived much in ever since was on reading these words in 1 Timothy 1.17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And Edward said, as I read those words, there came into my soul a sense of the glory of the divine being, a new sense quite different from anything I ever experienced before. Never any words of Scripture seemed to me as these words did. And Edwards was transformed and changed by the power of this word. When I was in college, I was sitting in a rocking chair, of course, right? And my life was wrecked. And my heart was so troubled with sin and life, and I was contemplating actually giving up. And I felt something similar to Augustine. And it was almost like take up and read. And there was a Catholic Bible sitting in my parents' bookcase. And I took it up and I started reading it every night for at least a year, just in fear and trembling. And, and, and just I had to find something of God until I told you before Billy Graham came to town. I met someone, I talked with someone this morning who said she was praying for me and didn't even know me. She was with a group praying before that a crusade took place that God would convert. So thank you, my sister. (laughs) And as he preached that gospel, my heart was strangely warmed with the power of the cross. And I remember that moment that the Bible became my lifeline to God. And I went out and I bought a Strong's Concordance. Any any of you remember the Ark bookstore off Federal? That's the place. And I, I, I hate to admit it, but I got Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith's CD. It was all I knew at the time, but I remember getting that concordance, and every morning I would just get up and I would just comb over the scriptures, 
and a verse would grip me, and I would take a note card, and I would write it down, and then I would carry it with me in my car, and I would memorize it. And then at college, every break that I ever had in between a class, I went to the library, got out my Bible, and just started laboring over that word. And then one day, a guy named John MacArthur was coming to Riverside Baptist, and he said, I got a seminary, and it will teach you how to study this word and proclaim it. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in. And it's been my lifeline. And it's truly of more value to me than anything else that I possess. I've given a, a life to know it. And it's always new. It's just so living and active. I love it. And I'm as excited about this word as I was 30 years ago. Why? Because it's the word of God. And it's, it's from him. It's powerful. And it reveals him and life and how to live and know him and walk with him. This is the word of God. And I want to pray and unpack these last two verses together, and I want us to worship. I want your hearts to be overwhelmed that God has given us His Word. Last week we saw it's a lamp on this journey to our our true destination when Christ is going to come back in all of His glory. And until that, we live in this dark world, and He's given us this lamp to know Him and to walk faithfully by and we, we live in this Word. This Word is our lamp, and it shows us truth and how to live. And he says there's going to be a day when it's going to come, and Jesus is going to come in his, all of His glory, and we're just going to see Him as He is, and it's going to be no longer darkness. All truth is going to be revealed and made known to us. And so let's pray one more time. Father, I pray, don't let any heart let this get by. God, this is so important what we look at. And it can't just be understood academically. It's got to get into our hearts. And these books become our lifeline. And we comb over them and we seek it and we want to know you and we want to know how to live for you and we want to know our end and our future and our past. God, we thank you for redemptive history that you've revealed in this book. God, let every heart have a passion for this word. To know their God. Let them use their lamp. Don't let them wander around in darkness not knowing over what they stumble. Give them a Bible to show, God. Let them see the truth and reveal yourself to them. Change, transform, make them new from the inside to the outside. Give them hope and a peace. God bless Southside Bible Church this morning with the overwhelming beauty and thought that we have a word from you who reveals to us Jesus Christ. We find Jesus Christ in this Bible. Oh God, I pray, let us treasure this beautiful gift. In verse 20, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. And so I want to set the context because most often this verse is pulled out to prove the inerrancy of the Word of God, and it does just that. But there's a context of why. Why does Peter bring it into his letter at this point? Was he just sitting there going, i got to prove inerrancy of Scripture so that the rest of history, everyone will have this proof? That isn't it. And I just want to bring you back then to the flow of our first section, verses 1 through 4. The divine power. The divine power has been given to us for everything that you need for life and godliness. And you are empowered, he said, by Christ. This power flows through communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been joined to him in relationship. Power flows. And it flows through promises that are precious and magnificent all through the word of God. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. So be taken up with them, get these promises, study them, look at them, and they give us divine power to live past the the epithumias, the lusts and desires of this world. They, They will eclipse the promises of this world with better ones, higher, greater desires. Get in this book and let that fuel and empower you through communion with our Christ. And then our second section in verses 5 through 11 is that these promises in Christ, they do something. And they empower us not to be lazy and just float to glory. These these realities do something to a Christian heart. And they make us diligent. They make us diligent to grow in Christian virtue. They make us want to walk the way Jesus walked and think and love the way he did. These things don't just leave you sitting there going, oh, I get to go to heaven, nothing else matters. I want to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Give me growth or give me death. Put that on the tombstone, baby. (laughs) Give me growth or give me death is what the gospel does in a soul. 
And so the devil, the flesh, and the world are currents pulling against us to unbelief, to not believe these things. And Christ and all of his fullness empowers fight and passion to progress in our journey to Christ's likeness. And so we must be diligent to anchor our lives in the promises of God and the pursuit of Christ's conformity. It has to happen from the new birth. And then we looked at a third section. And this one promise is that Peter's going to focus on supremely of these glorious, magnificent promises. And it's of the second coming. It's of this glory that we looked at last week that was transfigured before him. He's coming again in that glory and that brilliance and that beauty. And so the Christian life is faith in two advents. The first coming of Christ to do redemption and the second coming to conquer all enemies and establish his kingdom forever. And if our assurance uh, and growth uh, and, and hope, both of them are to grow from these promises. And so Peter brings up the eyewitness experience that he had with the glory that's going to come. He saw it on the Mount of Transfiguration. He got a preview of what it will be like when Christ comes again in glory and it, it took hold of him and he was willing to die for it. And then he tells us that prophetic word. The prophetic word was like a lamp shining and we're to be guided by that lamp until the second coming when we will have the living word for the rest of eternity. The full revelation of who God is, is we get to stare at it every day in the face of Christ and he will fulfill all that this book has shown us. And so if I had to summarize the first chapter, I would say this, we're to be a people empowered by Christ and his promises as found in his word to lead a life of love, to lead a life of the fulfillment of the whole law to love. And it's so good, but Peter's not done with his argument yet. He's going to give us two more verses this morning. And the big question this morning is why are these words here? What is Peter doing as he closes out? And the first observation of this text is verse 20. But know this first of all. Uh, it makes you feel like maybe it's a new thought or a new sentence, but the King James, Ver King James Version, I think, gets it better translated where it says, knowing first of all. So knowing first of all, it's building off of verse 19. Knowing this first of all, here's the continued thought of the whole flow. Last week we saw that verse 19 is a call to give ourselves to the prophetic word of God until he comes back and returns to this earth in full glory. Give yourself to this lamp. So knowing first of all then this about the lamp, what is Peter's connection? What is his flow with verses 20 through 21? How does it relate and how is Peter connecting this? It really does matter. Commentators have several different thoughts on this. I got lost in a lot of commentaries this week. But it's important to our understanding because there's two main possibilities and all the other uh, possibilities I just felt you couldn't substantiate in the word. So I'm just trying to boil down some things this morning and you're going to have to think with me a little bit. I want you, sometimes I do the wrestling and just give you the final answer today. I want you to wrestle with me because I think it's going to help you get these things in your heart better. So what are the possibilities then of the connection of verse 19 to 20 through 21? Two. First is this is the reason. This is the reason why we should give heed to the prophetic word because it's from God. And the other possibility is it's how to do it. How do I give myself to the prophetic word of God? How do we give heed to this word? And if we remember this principle, it will help us give our lives to this word that God has given to us while we're waiting for his return. Come Lord Jesus, this is going to help us. It's going to tell us how to keep holding to this word and our hope waiting for Jesus to come back. And so it could be either one of those. Give heed to the lamp. Give heed to the prophetic word because this is the word of God. It's, it's not man's idea. It's not subjective. It's objective truth. So follow it. Or this word is God's word. It's inspired by him. And this word is how we're going to give heed to this word and follow it and do everything that we've learned in 1 Peter 1 until Christ returns. So the, the easy way out, and this is the one I usually take, is just say it's both, because you can't be wrong, right? If you say both, you're going to hit it between the eyes. But I think that Peter had a specific reason why he drops these two verses here at the end. 
And I want to give you a good answer from the text that we can walk out with the full power of what Peter is doing in these verses because it's, it's, it's been transformative in my own heart and I want you to leave with that this morning. So it's not going to be heresy either way so you can kind of breathe easy. Both are good possible answers and neither will lead you astray. But there's one is what the Spirit wanted you to get to help you give heed to His Word until He comes back. And so all I need, that I need that because life is very hard to stay in verses 1 through 11 while you're waiting for Christ, isn't it? It's not easy. It's a hard battle and journey to glory. I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to drift and meander and be apathetic and get familiar with these truths and start hoping in other things. That's my battle. And the answer to this then means a lot to me, and I pray it does to you as well, because I need everything that God wants to give us to help us make it until the return of Christ. Amen? I need every help I can get to keep holding on for this beautiful day when he comes back. And so let's look at the verses and see if we can make a solid interpretation of what God has for us in his sure word this morning. So verse 20. Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Nothing easy this morning. Just several schools of thought on this verse as well. There's three main interpretations. I'm going to give them all to you. And some of you are going to get bored stiff, and some of you are going to get excited about this. Uh, I get excited about it, so just smile and work with me and act like you're really interested. Um, I'm going to give you, and I, and I think the text demands these views. So the first one is the, the Roman Catholic view. And it's that Scripture is not a matter of our own interpretation. And how they would interpret it is that no individual can interpret prophecy on his own. You need the church to do so. You need the, the uh, authority of the church, the Pope, and they're the ones who are going to interpret it for you. And that was true until Vatican II that really kept the Scriptures locked up almost in Latin. And it came with harm because many in that day did not have a good understanding of the Scriptures then for themselves. And the times are very much changing within their church and their study Bibles now and they're opening the Word up and some beautiful things are happening with that. But we're back then to the whole Reformation. The whole Reformation was founded on this principle that the Scriptures trump ecclesiastical structures and teachings. So if you have something that the Pope said or something that the Bible says, the, the Reformation said the sure Word of God is what we bank on. And I pray that you would do the same thing here as that any elder, that you would never listen to what they say unless you have the sure word of God to back it. It trumps all authority. It's God's word. It's the only thing inspired is the word of God. Nothing else is. No song that you sing. Guys, nothing else is inspired but this word. And it trumps everything because it's a gift from God. And so the Protestant faith stands on this principle, sola scriptura, we get all of our truth from the Scriptures alone. The church and all of its ministers stand under the Word of God. The second other interpretation was Protestant, but it, it was the, it, they said it was the prophet's interpretation of his surroundings when he's writing. And so this was how the prophet interpreted his events, his surroundings, the things that were going on in the day. It was what he was writing about. And so what this view is saying is that no prophecy of Scripture was just their own interpretation of what was going on, but it was God's interpretation of telling them, here's what I'm going to do, here's why it's happening. And we would say true to that, but it just comes way short of what is going on in this verse, which is the third view, which would be my view, and I pray your view, you would see clearly. What it's saying is there's no indiv individual person shall be free to interpret Scripture according to your own private means. What it's saying is it's not subjective. It is not subjective. And this is, this is what I think it means. This is what I believe it feels. Most Bible studies can turn into, well, I think it means this. I think it means that. And it's just all subjective. And whatever you think truth is, it becomes it. That's what this is fighting against. The meaning of Scripture is not subjective. It is not based on how you feel about it, whether you like it, if you think it fits your society. It isn't it. That doesn't matter. We cannot just make Scripture mean what we want it to mean. The whole context of this letter is what? False teachers. And these false teachers, they're taking Scriptures and they're twisting them to mean what they want them to mean and even for their own gain. 
So they're abusing the Scriptures and twisting, and Peter's coming and saying, "Uh uh-uh, you don't get to do that with Scripture. There's a very clear meaning in almost every cult. Every cult will say, we hold to the Bible, most of them. And then they twist it to fit their own reasonings, their own interpretations, their own comforts, and their own gains. Listen to what Peter said in chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. And they're going to deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. They're going to creep in, and they're going to start sowing heresies right in your midst. And then he goes on to 2 Peter 3, verse 15. And regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. They're going to twist it. They're going to manipulate it. And this is what Peter right here is fighting against. This is what has crept into the church of God where he's writing. And Peter is preparing this church for his soon departure. He's telling them, my time's at hand, I'm leaving. And you need to know your salvation, chapter 1. You've got to be certain of it. You need to know it and have full assurance. And secondly, you need to know your scriptures and your foundation of what you hold truth with. And these scriptures that I'm telling you to hold to, he said, are inspired by God. And they have His meaning and their truth. And we are to dig to get at that and to draw out His meaning and not our own whims and fancy stories. we got to dig into the Word. It's inspired and draw out the God-breathed meaning of this Bible. In verse 20, then, know this first of all, then no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. No individual is able to interpret Scripture according to his own personal whims and fancies. And then listen to verse 21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So he begins with the word for. And this 21 is the reason why we can't interpret it according to how we feel or what we think. It's a dangerous thing. Because no prophecy of Scripture is from man. That, that matters, and you, you better care. And that's why it says you better be careful to be a teacher, and you better study to show yourself approved, because this is scary stuff. This is God's Word. It's, it's not from man. It's from God. And this is just so beautiful. As guys, we have 66 books written by all different people so as to catch all of their personalities, their own traits, their experiences, and their own communication styles. And God causes them to write exactly what He desires or wants without destroying that freedom of who they are and how they think. So the Bible is God's Word. It's His ideas. It's His communications through human instruments and his spirit oversaw the whole thing so that what you hold in your hand is inerrant there is not one mistake in it it's the word of god and so this word it is it's god breathed without error god's truth so we don't come to it and say what do i think this means do i like what it says that's cutting me a little bit i don't like that let me change it Let me come up with some creative way to get rid of what I don't like. Rather, we strive to find God's intended purpose in every verse. And God uses words and context and language and meaning and history for us to get the true meaning of what He intended in His Word. And so the meaning of Scripture, it's not up to our own interpretation. It's not shaped and made into what we want it to mean. It shapes us into what God wants us to be. I'm going to say that again. It's not shaped and made into what we want it to mean. It shapes us into what God wants us to be. That's what it does. That's this word. It shapes us. God has spoken, and you hold that in your hand this morning. Let that do something to you. This is the word of God. God's meaning, then, is what we're striving for day in and day out. 
We give hours and hours every week by the science of interpretive skills and praying and asking the Spirit, reveal, open, and show. We check with other uh, historians what, is, what has been accepted throughout church history and understandings, and to stand up and be able to say, thus saith the Lord. And all authority of God, we speak. I'm a coward. When I do announcements, I don't know if you've noticed this, I shake. I dropped speech class three times in college because I hate public speaking. I'm terrified of it. But you give me the Bible and I say, thus saith the Lord. Ken Murphy's gone. This is the authority of God. And we need to look at it and hold it and treasure it as such. Okay, off my hobby horse. Let's pull out then and answer the question that I posed at the very beginning. This truth is what has affected my whole life and everything I do, and I pray for you as well. This is the Word of God. Give yourselves to know it and be transformed by it and understand it. Don't play with it. So what what did I pose at the beginning? What's the connection between verse 19, his flow of argument, and these two verses? And now I'm going to give you a clear answer. The flow from this chapter is the main point. Confirm your calling and election in verse 10. Know it. Peter wants you to have full assurance so the promises will have their full effect and power in your life. You, you, to really have the promises work in your life, you've got to know you're a child of God. I can't read promises and say, I wonder if they're mine. That doesn't change lives. This is mine. This is my letter from God. These are my promises and they change lives. So Peter's so wise, you've got to get full assurance. You need that to live this way. And then the genuineness of your faith is proven in verses 5 through 7 of God's power made visible through changed and transformed lives. And so the the way the power of God flows is precious and magnificent promises. we got to stay upon them and stand firm in the second coming and rest in it and look for it and hasten and urge it. And guys, this gives us power then against all the other promises that are held out to you daily as you answer those promises with God's promises in Christ. They're better, they're more superior than anything this world will ever offer you. And my question is, where do we learn these promises? Can these promises really be relied upon? Why does God take an oath? I swear by God that these things will come to pass. That's why we need to know it's the sure word of God. We need to know it's God's word to us and not man's. It's not a man's interpretation, but it's God's bedrock word that Peter saw that glory and God said it's coming back. It's going to return in this bedrock word. And therefore, I can bank my whole eternity on this. I can live different. I can come and cut against this whole world system and I can go and live because I have the sure bedrock word of God telling me what's coming. And so what was this church facing? Do you remember 1 Peter? Nero and the whole society had turned against them and they're going to be martyred for their faith. There are fiery ordeals that came upon them. And it's so hard when a whole society turns against you. And it treats you like you're a fool for believing such stupid things. And where is this coming, they say. It's been thousands of years. I don't see it. <laughs> We've had thousands more years since those mockers. They're just making fun of you silly Christians. All the battles that you're facing, the depressions day in and day out, the unbelief that that entangles us and holds to us. It's just so hard to hold on and not give in and go with the world system. And false teachers say, you can have both. You can have Jesus in eternity and take the whole world and drink it up. You can have both. They're coming and they're saying this in the days of Peter. Licentiousness, Christianity is all around you saying the exact same thing today. How do we stand up to all of this? Where do I go with the world attacking and all the confusing thoughts and the false communications being thrown at me on a daily basis? Where do I run to? I run to the sure word of God. It's bedrock. It's true. It will never change. It won't be something different tomorrow. God isn't going to come up with a new plan. Peter said it will not disappoint the one who holds out to the very end. The one who believes in him will not be disappointed. This is how we hold on to the sure word of God to the end. 
This is how we give heed to the prophetic Word of God. We get it in this Word. The sure Word. In it we read about another world, another kingdom that has come and been inaugurated. We read about the consummation that is coming. And it was promised by the God of this Word. And He says, I'm coming again. Amen? This Word is sure. It holds us, it helps us, it comforts us, it restores us, it lifts our head, it fills us with hope again. This Word, not one jot or tittle will not be fulfilled. Not one is not from God. Oh, that we would give ourselves to this Word and that you would make it your book and that you would learn it and know it and labor in it and get mentors to lead and deepen you and guide you in it. Get mentors. Grow in it. And then the most important is believe it and then trust it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bank my life on these truths. I'm going to give myself to these truths. I'm not going to just leave them here. I'm going to trust my life to what this word reveals as truth. One day, my dear brothers and sisters, the invisible king will rise and he will come to earth in power as a lion. And the life of stroking and striving to become like Jesus Christ will be fulfilled and entrance into his kingdom will be abundantly supplied to you. Keep stroking. And brethren, go to the scriptures. Go daily. Go long. Go deep. Go truly. Seek his true meaning. Find promises that give you hope from his word. It's a lamp unto my feet. Keep doing that until the light is going to be the noonday sun and it's going to rise and it's going to give full revelation and light of who God is for all of eternity. And until that day, we have the sure word of God as a lamp. And so praise God for this book. I had a professor at seminary who had a library collection of Bibles and we asked what was his favorite one. And he had this one that was covered in blood, half of it. And it was when Bloody Mary was if they wouldn't recant their faith, they would, they would kill them and cut open their stomachs and stick the Bibles uh, right there inside of them. And so they, they believed this bedrock word to the point of I can't recant the truth. And I'm willing to even die for this book because it's bedrock. And they gave up their lives for it. Right now we have a nightlight. I want you to give yourselves to it to walk by that light. It's going to give birth to something really, really glorious if we hold on to the end. And as I close, I'm just going to share something that happened in history. I think it was the 1600s. And it was a man preaching about the Bible and, and its neglect. And so my application as we just kind of close this is just to, to beg you not to neglect the sure word of God that's been given to us. How can you walk without a lamp? You're going to stumble and trip and you got to have this lamp. How are you going to raise children without a lamp to keep shining and teaching them of Christ? And we, we got to have this lamp. And so the preacher was Thomas Goodwin. And I can't remember if he was reporting it or if he was the one preaching it. But he was preaching on the subject of the Scriptures and he began to deal with the congregation's neglect of the Bible. And he impersonates God to the people. And he says this, <clears throat> Well, I've trusted you so long with my Bible. You've slighted it. It lies in such and such houses, all covered with dust and cobwebs. You care not to listen to it. Do you use my Bible so? Well, you shall have my Bible no longer. And, the, and he takes up the Bible from his cushion, and it seemed as if he was going to go away and just carry it away from the church. <clears throat> and then immediately he turns again, and he impersonates the people of God. And they fall down on their knees and they cry and they plead most earnestly, Lord, whatever thou dost to us, take not the Bible from us. Kill our children, burn our houses, destroy our gods, only spare us thy Bible, only take not away thy Bible. And then he impersonates God again to the people. Say you so, well, 
I will try you a while longer, and here is my Bible for you. I will see how you will use it, whether you will love it more, observe it more, practice it more, and live more according to it. And by these actions, uh, he put all the congregation into so strange a posture that many tears began to be shed from this church. And when the preacher went outside, it said he hung on his, the neck of his horse for 15 minutes, just weeping. And before he could even get enough energy to mount the horse again, and the Spirit of God fell on that congregation, and there was a, a revival in that whole town because they took up the Word of God again, and they gave it its rightful place. And so I pray that the Spirit would lead us to our Bibles. It's the Word of God. It's our lifeline. It's our lamp until that great day when we won't need it anymore. It'll all be fulfilled, and we can look right in the eyes of Christ. And so I pray that we would be a church of, of the book and it would be renewing our minds and, and growing our hope and our communion with the Christ that's revealed in it so that we would be diligent to stroke and strive to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this chapter. I thank you that you used an instrument like Peter and what all he faced and what he had learned. What brilliant wisdom. And yet I thank you that every word he wrote he was moved along and led by the Holy Spirit of God. So every word this man wrote down, you superintended. He wrote freely and truly in what he thought. And your spirit made sure that every, every word was God-breathed. And so I thank you, Lord, for what we hold in our hands this morning. May we believe it. May we entrust ourselves to this word. And may we give ourselves to know it and learn from it, and see all of your glory that is revealed in it. God, let Southside Bible Church be a people of the Word of God. And we thank you for this Word. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.